Hello, everyone. Uh, I think we can get started. Uh, a few people are still trickling in, um, but you know, in in um, to to keep with the time, we can get started. So, my name is Swanika Balasubramanian. I am the CEO and co-founder of Repurpose Global, the world's first plastic credit platform, building a global community of consumers and businesses going plastic neutral. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time uh, to join us today um, in this Repurpose web webinar, which is part of a series of Circular Pulse webinars that we're doing to highlight innovations and industry trends in the plastic waste sector. So if you want to stay informed of all our upcoming events, uh, please go to plasticneutral.global and uh, sign up for our newsletters and you'll have everything you need um, uh, to, to keep uh, with the trends. So today we have a very special webinar um, in collaboration with the United Nations World Oceans Day campaign on the topic of innovation innovating for ocean finance. And our moderator um, is Gaurav Gupta, partner and climate lead at Dalberg Advisors. So Gaurav's work has included developing the Indian Climate Collaborative, a peak body for corporate and philanthropic coordination on climate leadership and investments. He advises several Fortune 500 companies um, on clean energy transition and in building sustainable business models to distribute affordable technology across the water and energy sectors. Gaurav also founded a major climate change advocacy NGO that is now part of Al Gore's climate reality organization. So Gaurav will be moderating our panel today as well as the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So for uh, those of you who are new to kind of the Zoom uh, webinar feature, there's going to be a little box at the bottom that says Q&A um, and you can put in all your questions uh, to Gaurav and to the panelists throughout the course of the webinar and, and we'll keep uh, moderating it and try to get to as many as we can at the end um, and at the end of the webinar. Uh, this is separate from the chat function. So the chat can be used for kind of informal conversation between other attendees as well as if you have uh, other questions to ask uh, myself or some of the other people uh, on here. But just again, uh, highlighting the Q&A feature is the main feature that we will be using um, at the very end uh, when Gaurav will switch to that section. Um, also want to highlight that for every person who attends, Repurpose is going to be removing 100 ocean bound pouches from our ecosystem. We're about at 200,000 uh, at the moment. So please keep joining. Um, also send the link to your colleagues uh, if they want to join in as well. Um, very much looking forward to this. Thank you once once again. Um, and without further ado, I'd love to welcome uh, Gaurav. Monica, thank you. Uh, and thanks for that great introduction. I, I never knew you could just, you could create impact just by attending a webinar. So thanks for <laughs> sort of doing that. And look, I think, you know, uh, finance is an area that we at Dalberg work a lot in, but I actually chose to um, uh, attend this webinar for personal reasons. Uh, I, uh, a few years ago, spent my life savings buying an ecotourism business next to the Great Barrier Reef. And that, you know, what that business does and how it survives and how it grows is very much reliant uh, on essentially the value, the real economic value that actually the Great Barrier Reef creates. Uh, and so uh, this, this issue is a, is a personal issue. It's my life savings are energy. So I'm actually really delighted that we have such great guests who are, who are actually fighting on a day-to-day -day basis and also thinking about how to finance uh, for uh, the protection of the ocean. So I'll, I'll set it up a little bit, really, I think, spend more time hearing from our, from our great guests. Uh, but I think, I'm sure everyone who has joined the call is already well informed, but just to I think, set the scene, the ocean economy is actually set to grow twice, at the twice the rate of the mainstream economy by 2030. And the economic value, and I think these things are always a little bit rubbery, but it's really the, it's interesting just the ballpark itself. You know, the latest estimates say it's, 24 trillion US dollars is the actual value of ocean assets, uh, which would actually make it the seventh largest economy by GDP globally. Um, in the coming decade, marine energy, marine biotechnology, coastal tourism, which is my personal interest, transport, food production sectors, they all offer unprecedented development and investment opportunities. But we all know that they're also at incredible threat um, because of unsustainable economic activity. And um, with ocean health and impacts tightly linked to the threats of climate change and other anthropogenic threats, such as overfishing, habitat destruction, pollution, large amount of capital is effectively at risk. So this idea of talking about 
uh, finance is actually critical because it, it's one place we can bring people together to talk about the huge amount of value that sits in oceans and how that value is at risk or how that value can actually potentially drive growth in the future. And, it, and just very quickly, if you look at some of the surveys that are done, Credit Suisse did one in 20, uh, a very recent one in 2020, three in four investors, according to their survey, have not assessed the impact of their investment portfolios on ocean sustainability. I think we'll hear a little bit about that today as well. And a fifth are completely unaware of ocean-related risks to the value of their investments. So even though today we will hear from people who have probably been looking at this issue for decades, um, the reality is it is not yet a mainstream conversation or not enough of a mainstream conversation. And I think that's part of the thing that will make this very interesting. And for us as advisors in the development space where we've seen lots and lots of new things that have come up that need financing in new and innovative ways, the question always is, what is different about this particular sector in terms of the challenges it faces and getting finance to it? And I think that's the question I will place to all of our panelists today as they think about their presentation, is to talk about the need, but also to talk about what is different. Because we have solved these things before, not maybe enough, but finance has come in to look at various challenges in the energy and the health, increasingly in the climate, clearly uh, not enough. But what's different, and the thing that strike me as, again, a layperson in this, is that unlike, a lot of, unlike, for example, the climate challenge, there is no one measure. And measure is such an important aspect of financing. Uh, climate is able to, even though in some cases the science is still uh, unfinished, climate is able to turn everything into a CO2 equivalent. There is a single measure that people rally around. What is that measure for oceans? Because we're looking at both plastics, we're looking at unsustainable fishing, we're looking at the destruction of actual uh, marine ecosystems and so forth. What are those measures that we can sort of rally around and do we need something that is a carbon equivalent? And property rights, while I'm not gonna claim that we don't have land disputes still going on that cause huge problems, there's the, the, if you look at uh, property rights within water, it's still an even more rubber issue and potentially the real flashpoints for the next 20, 30 years. Uh, so do we, do we really understand what the jurisdictions are and then does that cause challenges in, in trying to come to a common sense around what, are, what exactly is the market? How do you finance that market? So without further ado, I just wanted to set that up to then get this really wide range of views that we'll get from our panelists because they really do represent different parts of that value chain and bring really interesting perspectives. So let me quickly introduce those and I will give one line introductions only because Google and LinkedIn will be far better at this job than I will. So please feel free to use them. But firstly, I'm just really delighted to introduce Nicholas Kolesh. Uh, he's Vice President of Projects at the Alliance to End uh, Plastic Waste. Uh, he has a great background in both marketing and strategy. And what, very importantly, his career has spanned pet, uh, petrochemicals and the plastics industry. And now he's sitting on top of this really important alliance, um, which he'll tell you a little bit more about. But uh, the group that he represents is committed uh, close to one and a half billion dollars over the next five years to fund projects uh, that essentially end plastic waste. Uh, so we'll tell you more about that. Thanks, Nicholas, for joining us. Uh, we've got Peter, uh, who is with Swanica. Swanica already did a great job of introducing Repurpose. Well, Peter is the co-founder. Uh, he was also, to his great credit, an intern at Dalberg. So thank you for the few months you spent with us, even though you decided not to come back. We don't hold that against you. Um, we then have uh, Pavan Patil, senior economist at the World Bank. When I talked about the fact that for some of us, uh, ocean finance is new, but for others have been championing it for a long time, or well, Pavan is probably one of the best people I can think of for that, um, where you know, over the last 20 years, he's uh, co-developed the bank's multi-billion dollar portfolio on oceans and blue companies. So I think he can give you a view of the time as well on how the space has evolved and what's needed and how we go forward. Also sits on uh, the board of various things, including uh, the Nike Foundation, Youth to Youth, uh, Mapping Ocean Wealth, and so forth. So it brings a real uh, wealth of experience there. And last but not least, we have uh, Daniela Fernandez, uh, who I was, uh, I'm just amazed at what, has, what she has been able to achieve at such a young age. Um, she founded the Sustainable Ocean Alliance at the age of 19. So 
that's an ambition for all of us to aim for, and unfortunately I'm well past that. Uh, organized the first annual Sustainable Ocean Summit, which convened millennials, NGOs, business executives, and leaders to discuss the challenges and potential solutions. Her organization has kept that spirit up of really creating new leaders uh, in the ocean space. Uh, and so we'll hear a lot about also that people dimension, but importantly, they also then fund uh, organizations who are trying to make a difference in ocean. So we'll also hear a bit about how they think about uh, financing. So that's the, that's the panel. And what we'll start with is uh, each of the panelists will uh, kick off with a bit of a five minute presentation talking about their organization, but especially how it relates to ocean finance and their perspectives on it and what needs to be done. And then we'll go into some uh, Q and A and I'll also look forward to uh, some great questions from the audience. Uh, I should tell you that all the panelists have been kind to not know any of the questions beforehand. They're very happy to engage in a really open dialogue. Uh, so we appreciate that. So please make your questions difficult. And with that, I'm gonna actually call on Nicholas to kick us off and there will be some slides presented as well. So uh, do look, look out for that on your screens. Thanks, Nick. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, it's a really uh, a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Repurpose for uh, uh, having me on this uh, webinar today and also to the fellow panelists for, for joining. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Alliance to End Plastic Waste on this uh, World Oceans Day. Um, so the Alliance is a, it's a unique organization. Um, we are a, an organization that's made up of uh, member companies from across the plastics value chain, from the manufacturing sector, uh, where I was originally coming from, all the way through to the waste management sector uh, and everything in between. So our purpose is to enable global action uh, at scale to deliver uh, local solutions. Uh, we see this as a collective effort uh, across all members of the value chain. And we have the benefit of a, a lot of knowledge on the technical side, on the material side, uh, as well as engineering uh, in both the manufacture, but also in the, uh, the waste management, uh, which is the critical element here. Um, we, we can really leverage those collective resources uh, to, to do a lot. And you heard we have about a one and a half billion dollars at our disposal uh, for supporting projects that will make a real difference uh, in ending plastic waste in the environment. Uh, but these organizations, they're also um, some of the leading companies in the world, and they are allowing us to reach really into the local communities as well uh, and providing us with guidance as many of them are coming from the regions where uh, the challenges are greatest. Um, so those local insights are, are really important for us. Uh, when we think about our alliance and, and what we are focused on, we have uh, really four pillars that are guiding our activities. Those pillars are infrastructure, innovation, education, and cleanup. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, the focus is really on funding new approaches to build and deploy critical waste management infrastructure and systems to collect and manage plastic waste and, and ultimately to increase recycling and the valorization of waste plastics. We also focus on innovation, so supporting ideas and, and scaling new technologies to drive a circular economy of plastics. Uh, and we're funding the capacity building and providing incubation services to companies and NGOs and organizations that can make, make change happen through innovation. We're also focused on education, so it's really important to engage with the communities where we're active, but also the communities where we, where, where we all live uh, to ensure lasting change to end plastic waste in the environment. There's a systemic issue here, but there's also individual behavioral issues as well, which we're, uh, we're focused on. And last but not least, uh, cleanup is, is, is an important thing. We like to say we like to clean things up once if possible, because we want to put systemic solutions in place, right? Things that will address the problem at source. But nevertheless, we're supporting communities and organizations in cleanup activities. Uh, to end for an environment that's, that's free of plastic waste. So those, those are our four focus areas. And when we think about how we work together and how we can participate in ocean finance and, and other areas, uh, there's quite a number of, of activities that we need to focus on. We need to be inclusive and holistic, action-oriented and collaborative. And we can do that because of our membership and because of the engagements we have uh, across the value chain, but also with many NGOs, governments, and so on that uh, can make a difference. So those, those differences come from working together, uh, bringing these perspectives from, uh, from the knowledge that each and every organization and NGO is bringing their expertise. Very importantly, it also enables us to use the funding from these organizations, but also to catalyze public and private investment into, into new solutions. So we want to enable 
uh, solutions. We want to be a, a de-risker of projects that can then be replicated and multiplied through, uh, through financing from other organizations as well. Um, it all comes down for us to solid integrated waste management infrastructure. We need to stop plastic waste flowing into the environment and that can only happen when communities have integrated waste management infrastructure at their disposal. And again, that's a huge challenge uh, that needs to be addressed. But we also need to change mindsets, as I said. Uh, there's behavioral aspects to it. Um, and we need to think about this as a huge challenge that, uh, that really is, is not solvable by any one organization. This is something we have to work on together uh, to really make a difference. And we do that through sustainable projects. Uh, we have a, quite a number of projects in our portfolio, which I'll talk about in a second. But we want to work on projects. We want to be action-oriented on the ground, investing money in meaningful solutions that, uh, that bring real difference. So some of those examples include uh, initiatives in, in many parts of the world. Uh, our focus is on the highest leakage areas. So in Southeast Asia, in India, in parts of Africa and in China, where we have uh, massive amounts of plastic waste that unfortunately is unmanaged and leaking into the environment. So our first project that we focused on uh, in this list here is uh, Zero Plastic Waste Cities. It's an initiative we formed with uh, Grameen Creative Lab. Um, and it's looking at in installing waste management infrastructure in, in two cities, one in India, Puducherry, and another in Vietnam, uh, the city of Tanan. So we're looking to harness the informal market uh, to close the loop on waste collection and sorting um, and providing waste processing plants, recycling, composting solutions to segregate waste. A second similar project is, is Project Stop. Uh, this is an initiative that was started by the company Borealis together with uh, the consultancy Systemic. And uh, they've done three installations and, and the Alliance Stem Plastic Waste has supported and driven on the third one, which is in the place called Jembrana in Bali in Indonesia. And again, it's about an integrated waste management system that can be uh, hopefully replicated and scaled uh, to many other communities. So it's about installing the basics of collection, sorting uh, and processing of waste, uh, of which around 14 to 15% is plastic uh, and ensuring that those communities have waste management infrastructure. Another interesting project number three here is the work with the Asase Foundation in, in Ghana, in Accra. And here they have installed some uh, capabilities around waste management, uh, but we're supporting them to expand that and to enable women uh, to develop as entrepreneurs to use uh, waste plastic that's coming from these facilities uh, and to, to monetize it through the production of products. And so the Asase Foundation is providing them with uh, business and, and entrepreneurial guidance. Uh, we're also incubating a lot of uh, companies through a, a partnership with uh, Plug and Play, the End Plastic Waste Innovation Platform. Uh, and this is a series of events held uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, in Paris and in Singapore, where we're working with now up to 60 uh, companies to support them in developing their business models to end plastic waste in the environment. Really encouraging and a lot of uh, fantastic ideas that are out there that we can support with, with financing, uh, many of them to, to stop plastic waste leaking into the environment and ultimately into the oceans. And last but not least on this list, uh, it's one of uh, many projects that we're working on, but we, we want to focus on technology, on innovation. Uh, advanced recycling is an area where we can make a big difference uh, leveraging the knowledge and capabilities of our, our member companies. So we've got a couple of projects in feasibility in Indonesia where we're looking at advanced recycling solutions for uh, chemical recycling to take plastic and turn it into again, a valuable end product that can be used again. So quite a number of, of projects. We have actually 14 projects running at the moment, uh, but we are looking to, to build a huge portfolio of projects that will really enable change. And, and a lot of them are targeted at ending plastic waste in the environment, ending plastic waste on land, ensuring that it does not flow into the oceans, that there is no unmanaged waste. So our goal is to end plastic waste and, uh, and to secure the future of communities that are that are struggling to handle this today. So that's a little bit of background on what we're doing and uh, and the focus of the Alliance and Plastic Waste. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for going through that. Uh, let me turn it over to Peter. Repurpose. Hi, this is Peter. Uh, I'm a co-founder and chief marketing officer of Repurpose Global. Let me just pull up my slides. Give me one second. Um, but it's great to be here today, um, and uh, we started talking a little about our work and during this important event. 
Um, so we are inspired, very, very much inspired by Carbon Credits. Uh, we're the world's first plastic credit platform, um, whereby we help individuals and businesses take effortless and impactful climate action and go plastic neutral by financing the removal and recycling of ocean and ocean bound plastic waste worldwide. Um, and the problem that we're addressing here is very simple, is that our world is simply not dedicating nearly enough money uh, to solving the most critical challenges of our generation. Plastic pollution, obviously one of them, and we've seen thousands of organizations with effective solutions across the entire value chain of reduce, reuse, redesign, and recycling, but are simply underfunded. And because of that, they aren't able to scale up their environmental or social economic impacts. And when uh, more money has gone into WeWork as a company than every recycling startup uh, in the past 24 years in the world combined, uh, no wonder why we're left so clueless about solving this problem as large as ocean plastic pollution. Um, so concretely, the, the way that funding gap translates into on the ground is in three different ways. Uh, one is that too much of plastic waste today is simply too low value to be actually diverted from oceans, landfills, or incineration. Uh, plastic uh, resin types like PET, HDP are widely recycled uh, and not saying there aren't problems in those supply chains, but if you look at what's actually ending up in the oceans today, it's a resin grades three through sevens, is the uh, uh, flexible films, the multi-laminate packaging, the styrofoam, the, uh, you know, the, the, those kind of plastic waste, um, which because it never is technically, is technically unrecyclable or is simply too low value to be actually, uh, you know, uh, to be deemed worthy by commercial uh, uh, operations in the first place, they end up uh, not being diverted into the recycling stream. That's number one. Number two, waste management infrastructure is also underfunded in both the developing world and the developer. That's what's the surprising part, uh, at where in rural areas, in island nations, as well as in many areas of Europe and the US, uh, there simply is not enough infrastructure to actually deal with plastic uh, waste when we actually collect it in the first place. Um, and number three, this is more of a systemic issue where there uh, isn't enough funding going in towards commercializing early stage innovations uh, in the reduce and reuse space where, you know, they aren't competitive enough or they are simply either are competitive from a price perspective or not competitive from a scale perspective to actually compete with conventional solutions uh, in the market. Um, and on the other side of the equation, for, not from the impact side, but from the business and the customer and the uh, consumer side, where we see that there's a massive gap between what customers want today, which is products that don't pollute the environment, uh, and what businesses are realistically able to accomplish, where plastic waste, plastic is part of every supply chain and it's really difficult to, uh, it really isn't a uh, very quick, affordable, easy and effective ways uh, for companies to dramatically slash their plastic footprints. And that's uh, essentially where we bridge the pieces of the puzzle together and launch the plastic credit platform where we help people and businesses go plastic neutral by financing the removal, avoidance, and recycling of as much plastic waste from nature as they use uh, in their packaging and operations in daily lives through our global network of innovations across three different continents and uh, three uh, seven different countries. Uh, so the way it works is very simple. Um, for On average, for every 50 cents contributed to our platform, we guarantee to remove fund innovations on the ground that remove and recycle one additional kilogram of plastic waste, otherwise landfill burned or flushed into the oceans. And the way it works is that we are a financing platform uh, between two different uh, sides. On the one side uh, is businesses and individuals who want to take responsibility for their plastic footprint. On the other side is innovators on the ground that need more financing to scale up where number one, we help these uh, consumers and businesses measure their plastic footprints uh, and uh, charge 50 cents per kilogram on average to compensate for that footprint. We will use this money in number two to fund solutions on the ground that then use the money to intercept and recycle as much plastic waste as the brand or the consumer has sponsored to remove and recycle and declare themselves as plastic neutral. But that's not it. Plastic neutrality is not just about offset, it's also a framework for creating change where we help these companies and individuals actually cut down the amount of virgin plastic they use going forward after having offset it uh, from not only a financial incentive, but also nudging them with knowledge and resources to help them take action in the supply chain going forward. Um, and the way we work is through an ecosystem approach where we finance local experts and entrepreneurs with decades of experience. Uh, instead of doing it ourselves, we uh, work with these, and our theory of change is to work with these organizations. And we currently uh, have uh, 10 different projects running in three different continents and seven different countries uh, in India, Sri Lanka, Philippines, uh, uh, Kenya, uh, uh, Brazil, Colombia, and et cetera, across three uh, different developing continents. And 
Um, the way it works and how we actually deploy the money on the ground uh, is very simple as well, is to achieve a delta, achieve more plastic waste removed and recycled from the environment than currently was happening in the status quo. Uh, so number one, as I was saying earlier, subsidizing the cost of recovering low value plastic waste from the environment that would have otherwise been unprofitable. Number two, building new infrastructure like bailing machines and trucks and real estate and, uh, and, uh, and conveyor belts in areas with, in rural areas in, in India, for example, in island nations like Indonesia, where there simply isn't any infrastructure currently to deal with the plastic waste. And number three, in financing and scaling up and providing commercialization financing for innovations at the early stage and reduce and reuse based on the quantifiable plastic impact to enable their further scale up and going towards the market to be competitive out there. Um, so we also, in the project that we do, is very much verified in terms of our impact and from on the ground staff to a blockchain enabled dashboard to working with Vera to develop the world's first plastic standard, as well as having spot checks on an unannounced basis to actually make sure the impact is actually happening on the ground. Um, so quickly wrapping up, I mean, none of this is possible without the global community of consumers and businesses who actually worked with us and engaged with us on plastic neutrality. Uh, so from impact-driven small brands in the food and beverage space to large Fortune 500 companies in FNCG and financial services, uh, we have worked with a variety of companies to help them uh, define and meet their plastic neutrality uh, commitments like for manufacturers uh, where we help them attain certain certifications around plastic neutrality, plastic negativity, as well as you know, removing one kg or one pound of plastic for every one uh, product they sell, uh, to for workplaces for organizations like working actually with Dolberg where uh, Dolberg had launched its climate commitment and we're helping Dolberg also go plastic neutral uh, and, uh, and doing so for other employee-centric organizations who want to measure, compensate, and reduce their footprints as well. Um, as well as for retailers, finally, who have a platform um, and working with them to add a checkbox at the point of sale to enable their customers to actually offset their footprints. Um, so yeah, so a lot of details there, um, but you know, we are very open to partner with uh, institutional investors to popularize this financial instrument. Uh, we're open to submissions from innovators all across the value chain to, to be able to help them provide climate finance and uh, feel free to uh, ecosystem enablers and consultants all over the spectrum. Uh, we would love to talk to you about partnering and helping uh, your work and adding value to your work at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's me. Uh, over back to you, Gaurav. Thanks, Peter. And I, I think uh, aside from what, what I think is a great pitch, uh, uh, we'll come back to you about the difference between this and carbon neutrality, since that is where you uh, took the idea. I think what really will interest people is what are some of the differences in how you make this work for, for oceans. Definitely. Uh, let me now <clears throat> turn to Pavan uh, from the World Bank, talk a little bit about uh, sort of his journey in this space and what he thinks are the sort of crucial issues around uh, ocean finance. Pavan, over to you. Pavan, I think you have to be off mute. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, to repurpose for inviting me here today. And for all of those of you who are watching, I hope this uh, World Ocean Day keeps you safe and healthy and you're able to pair your passion uh, with the purpose that was needed and is needed in order to kind of make the changes that we want to see in the world. It is World Ocean Day 2020 and again, I'm delighted to be here. In fact, it's seven months later from when we invited repurpose to give some remarks at the World Bank IMF annual meetings in 2019. And so it's only fitting that this youthful energy and passion that they bring is able to imbibe itself across many institutions and in all the kind of work that we need to do in order to have a more sustainable ocean economy and address some of the pollution efforts, uh, pollution aspects that are facing and impacting adversely the ocean economy. So I'm gonna talk about what the World Bank does. And for those of you who don't know, the World Bank has many different brother and sister entities associated with it. It's a World Bank group. We have a publicly facing part of our finance. We're the largest public financier, uh, bar none, on ocean and ocean related investments. And this has been going on from, for the last 25 years that I've been at the World Bank group. When I joined, there was about $50 million of investment and now there's billions and billions of dollars of investment. 
However, I think you also all know that money alone is not going to solve the problem. It takes basically determination, it takes innovation, it takes collaboration and partnership to truly make the kind of difference that we want to see, and money becomes just an important glue to hang this all together. Great. So I think most of you already know, and this is why the World Bank is interested, because the ocean is an incredible ecological and economic zone that's important for so many aspects of our clients' lives. And we believe in poverty reduction and shared prosperity, and you can't have those without taking the environment into consideration, and particularly the environment. I think everybody knows who's watching that, you know, the oceans sequester five times more carbon than even tropical ecosystems. It's our greatest carbon sink. And in fact, every second breath we take is as a result of the ocean. And that becomes important because it connects mountain economies and ocean economies together for a shared way of trying to figure out how to systematically invest so that there's improvements for people and the planet. And of course, we know that it has tremendous values. Just taking fisheries, for example, we know that the trade in fisheries is two times that of, uh, of the value of coffee and the trade of coffee. And you know, there's about 85 nations and about $102 billion that are traded hand, trading hands all the time with respect to just fisheries and fisheries investments. The, going back to you know, 2010 and what the OECD kindly did along with World Bank statistics is it's assessed the ocean economy at about $1.5 trillion. Again is probably a way underestimate to what the true value is. But the point of the matter is about measurement. It provides an important marker. And when you look at the size of the ocean economy against all the other major economies of the world, you see that it has a value at even 1.5 trillion greater than the Russian Federation, just to put it in perspective. And again, knowing that that's a very conservative estimation. And we also know, and we heard from Gaurav earlier, that the reality and the statistics based on the evidence that the World Bank and many other organizations, organizations show that these maritime spaces are going to be driving new sources of growth and new jobs significantly over the next 10 years to the point where it's going to be the greatest engine for job creation and for growth for the future. Of course, the question is, how is it being derived? How is economically, how is the economic benefit being derived? And is it being derived sustainably? The fact of the matter is the ocean economy is not a clean economy. It's a dirty economy. And we have to figure out as financiers, as partners, as collaborators, as innovators, as thought leaders, how to figure out ways to make sure that sustainability is front and center of all of what we do across this important value chain. And of course, what we're talking about today is about plastic, but there are also many other threats to our ocean ecosystems, including agricultural runoff. But when we do talk about plastics, just think about this, that there is one garbage truck of plastic dumped into the oceans every minute. And that brings to life exactly what other uh, speakers have actually shared with us today. So when we talk about the bank's theory of change, there is a theory of change and it's around basically helping countries transition to a sustainable ocean economy or a blue economy. And what that means essentially is that where economic activity is in balance with ocean health. Because what we've witnessed and what we've seen, and I think all of you can intuit, that there's two parallel trends that are happening in this ocean space. Once there, one, there's a growth in the ocean economy for sure, but also there's a decline in health of the ocean environment. And in order to basically derive sustainable economic value from this space, there needs to be coexistence of sustainability amongst the growth. Today is actually a very important day on World Ocean Day 2020 because the World Bank, for the first time, created a regional program that involves all eight countries of South Asia. And in partnership with the South Asia Cooperative Environment Program and Parlay for the Oceans, have put the first down payment of $50 million 
to essentially ensure that we can bring and finance innovation to these countries, looking at what's happening in the communities, looking what's happening with the private sector, seeing what interactions that are happening between public and private sectors to essentially create and scale end-to-end -end solutions to end marine plastic pollution. Again, for us at the World Bank Group, this is a very historic day. It's also just a drop in the bucket that we hope will leverage multiple of billions of dollars and the insights and innovation that is not only shared by speakers today, but by all of those of you who are participant in this uh, uh, video conference and also passionate about turning the tide on ocean pollution. The fact of the matter is the ocean economy is growing. Our challenge is to ensure that it's growing sustainably. Thank you very much and over to you, Gauru. Thanks, Pavan. Thank you for visualizing that so well. That was a very Al Gore-esque, I should say, as well. It was, thank you for bringing that home. Um, let me now turn to Daniela, another great speaker and passionate advocate for the oceans, uh, to talk about her organization. Thank you, and happy World Ocean Day indeed, everyone. It's so exciting to see that we're all gathered here today to kick off this week. Let me quickly also pull up my slides. Give me one second. You, you may think that after a while you're used to dealing with Zoom, but it always takes a little bit of more practice. All right, there you go. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes I hope. Yes, great, wonderful. All right, so um, I'm, the, I'm the founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance, and, and I feel like a lot of you watching know SOA um, for our work uh, in, in two main programs, two main areas. First of all, we support the development of, of young leaders all over the world. We currently have young people in over 165 countries working on the ground to develop their own grassroots projects. Um, and in addition to that, we also have our Ocean Solutions Accelerator Program, which supports uh, startups all over the world, also in um, advancing their innovations and getting them to the next level. At our recent uh, conference, we announced our virtual conference that took place just last week. Um, we announced that we are also going to be supporting not only for-profit uh, startups, but also nonprofit startups starting this year. So. We are very excited to support um, a lot of different innovations in this space. But what a lot of you don't know us for is our, our investment. And what we did at Sustainable Ocean Alliance is we realized early on that a lot of the companies that we were supporting that went through our accelerator program, they, they received startup capital funding. So we gave them about a 25 thousand uh, dollar investment of seed funding to go through our program but then as there's a the common terminology in silicon valley there's a valley of death that occurs right after a, a company goes through an initial incubator or accelerator program what ends up happening is that they don't they're not able to raise a follow-on capital um, to get them from c to um, their the next their next series or the next round so in seeing a lot of the different trends that were going on in this space, um, we're seeing a lot of shifting consumer preference as we, as we know millennials and younger generations prefer to support companies that are doing good, not only for the world and the ocean, um, and, and that's a trend that it's definitely shifting things. We're also seeing a lot of legislation being passed uh, to support the environment, support our ocean space. And of course, we're also seeing a tremendous growth in the impact investment space, we have about, um, globally, we have about uh, $502 billion of assets under management in the impact investment space, uh, which was a, a huge spike from the uh, $200 billion that were under uh, market last year. So we're seeing this trend of, of people better understanding the impact investment space. And of course, as all of us that are here today understand, there's an urgency to not simply talk about the problem, but also talk about what are the solutions that we can implement to help protect our ocean. Also, um, as it was referenced earlier in this call, we, we, we see that the, the size of the ocean sustainability market, it's, it's, it's pretty large. Um, I won't go through all the numbers and figures, but you can see them on the screen. Um, the, the last uh, WWF report that came out valued the assets of the ocean at $24 trillion. And, and that encompasses everything from marine tourism, sustainable packaging, fisheries and aquaculture, maritime transport, and re renewable, uh, renewable energy. So 
as you can see here, there's a lot of opportunity for disruption and the better and the faster we can get there um, by investing in these companies, um, the better we, were, we will be off. So here is just a quick example of the types of companies that we have supported through our portfolio. Um, in 2018, we started our accelerator program uh, with just five startups. And uh, last year, we, we increased the number threefold and we supported 15 startups. So we have about 45% of our companies are in the marine pollution um, space. We have ocean data companies. We have sustainability, um, sustainable fisheries companies and other energy and habitat destruction mitigation companies. So um, this is part of the reason why we, we as a nonprofit created um, Seaboard Ventures, which is our venture capital arm of the organization, um, which will enable us to further support more companies and provide them a bigger check sizes and more support than we did traditionally um, through our accelerator program. You can see here just uh, a sector inside of our global reach. We have, we've received applications from companies all over the world. Uh, and it's really exciting to see that uh, the, the blue economy isn't necessarily just siloed um, as many other of these impact investment economies are, but rather there are a lot of people working on different solutions. And, and we are really happy to support, um, you know, folks from island nations, folks from, from all over the world uh, who have a passion um, for this sector. And here you can have just some, some quick examples of some of the companies we've supported. You can take a look at all of the companies on our website, but I definitely wanted to just flag that um, we have seen amazing innovations in the, um, in the autonomous vessel space, in the replacement of plastic space. Um, of course, Repurpose is one of our uh, companies as well. So you all know about them now. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just really excited to see how we're headed uh, into this ocean sustainability revolution and, and I think that one of the um, one of the pieces of advice I would give for anyone interested in, in being a part of the space especially investors is that you, you truly have to be an active investor when you are in the ocean economy space because there's a lot of room for growth and development but also these companies need a lot of support uh, and mentorship and guidance um, as we navigate to how to get them from just an idea to um, a scalable opportunity that we can all benefit from. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Daniela. And that, uh, I think that you gave us some really practical examples. And may maybe as we start the q and I'll actually start with you because I think everyone here has laid out uh, a really good set of reasons uh, for why we need more finance and what are all the important areas to invest in. But I, I think we shied away from what is, where are the areas of highest return on investment? And as someone who is looking at making equity investments such as yourself, I'm keen to know from you, um, how, do you guys have a view on what part of the value chain in the space of oceans is giving the highest return? Is it around the right at the start of designing things differently so that people don't even create plastic waste? Is it in the, in the sort of coastal communities and tourism space? What are some of the brightest spots of investment potential? Yeah, I think we've honestly seen it across the board, um, and that's what makes this space so exciting and, and it's so nascent, right? Whereas there's companies that are are looking for innovations um, that their their own internal R and Ds can't produce, so they you know they might uh, take a, a very early stage design company um, and, and buy it. Um, alternatively, we're also seeing a lot of innovations and potentials for uh, capital in the data space, right? There's so much that we don't know about the ocean. And so when you have scientists and you have corporations uh, looking into the space and not really understanding how to piece all the different components together, you see their areas of, of growth uh, in there as well. So I honestly feel like there's so much uh, potential that we're seeing and in the companies that we review, um, we do our due diligence based on you know, three different areas. The first area would be, you know, what's the potential of scale? How can this, how can this company not only um, support their local region, but how can we take that globally? Um, the second area is to your point, you know, what are, what are the potentials for, um, for an, of the investment, right? Are, do they have an actual business model? Do we see the potential of them um, making revenue in the short term and long term? And then of course, the third area that we look at is um, the impact, the positive Positive impact in the ocean space that they're having. Um, and I think you mentioned as well earlier on is uh, the, the impact metrics are so challenging. So us as investors and us and, as our as an accelerator as a nonprofit, we have to make sure that we're able to support our companies in, in tracking their impact and also making sure that they can communicate that impact with their investors. 
Well, let me bring Nick in on this because there is some criticism at times around that whole value chain to say, well, you know, cleaning up plastics is, is nice, but higher return on investment if you never produced it in the first place. And especially how do you redesign for uh, single use plastics? And there's a question that's also come up. Uh, Nick, how do you guys think about that? Because I mean, you guys have the largest amount of money to spend at the moment uh, in terms of discretionary capital. How are you thinking about where you're getting the biggest uh, bang for buck? And what are, what are the efforts you're involved in in terms of stopping plastic at source itself? Yeah, so it's a very good, uh, very good question. And I mean, our focus is on ending plastic waste in the environment, um, but that, that has a number of, uh, of, of source points to it, right? And uh, the goal for us is to investigate what are the, the options to, uh, to address the challenge through the specific projects that we're able to fund. So the Alliance is, uh, is able to play a role as, a, as an on-the-ground provider of, of support to uh, companies, to organizations uh, who want to implement specific solutions. And what we can do is, is, to, is to test those out, right? We can help them uh, de-risk their, their models. We can give them guidance and support um, and to see whether that is actually going to be a viable solution uh, towards uh, solving the problem in one way or another. So again, our role is, is very much to, to provide that de-risking function to be able to then scale some of these ideas up as we, as we help to develop them and, and ensure that they are actually self-sustaining uh, and that there's a return on investment uh, in order that, that they can function on their own going forward. But is, is, there, is there a bias for action towards designing to get rid of plastics in the value chain in the first place? I mean, where do you see your portfolio today versus where you see it in the future? Yeah, we have actually a number of focus points and one of them is design for circularity or design for recycling. Uh, and, and that's a really important aspect actually, because the easier you can make things to be recycled at the end of their life, uh, the, the higher the, the proportion that will, be, uh, that will be recycled. Again, when we look at PET or HDPE, typically those are higher recycled. They have a higher recycling rate because they're easier to recycle. There's other solutions that, that can be put in place uh, in respect of uh, multi-layer packaging, which you find today having many different plastics or many different components to it. If you can have a monomaterial solution, uh, that can help tremendously in uh, enabling recycling because you're not, you're not having a product that is actually made up of several different polymers, for example. And I'm sure, uh, Peter, that's a challenge for you, right? So you, you're, unlike carbon, um, you know, in a sense, not everything in plastics is actually recyclable. And I think people are interested in knowing is there a role that your company plays in that? And then uh, to my earlier question, uh, just tell us a bit about what's different about plastics neutrality from carbon neutrality in terms of the dynamics of what you're trying to build. Yeah, girl, that's a great question. I can take that kind of systemic question first and dive into the recyclability part. I think the biggest difference between carbon neutrality and plastic neutrality is uh, in the fact that there is, um, a, there's a connection in between the companies and the businesses for actually putting the money and the supply chains they're empowering. I think within carbon credits, what we end up seeing is that, you know, a company, let's say, you know, an organization, a professional services organization who's going carbon neutral, they are offsetting the emissions of maybe their employee travel or maybe a consumer brand is offsetting the emissions of the transportation um, by investing into completely different sectors, right? You know, cook stove distribution, renewable energy. Um, it's great that they are, you know, supporting the scale up of carbon financing overall, but the issue they're not addressing is the issue that, you know, that they were offsetting for the first place, which is their source of emission. I think the difference in plastic credits is that it's not part of the, the financing and the impact is not part of two completely different ecosystems. They're part of one, right? So one, a brand or an individual who, you know, particularly a business who is offsetting their plastic footprints, they are empowering the end of life. Uh, I mean, that's, that's only one of the three areas where we're putting offset uh, contributions, right? Which is the recycling bit where they are empowering the infrastructure because even if we dramatically somehow in the world reduces our plastic, uh, plastic consumption by 50% in the next 10 years, where's the other 50% gonna go? Because we don't have enough infrastructure to handle even that in the first place. And we know that regardless of what happens, plastic is gonna be part of our, part of our you know, uh, uh, yeah, a convenience economy going forward. 
Um, and then I think on the part about recyclability, that's exactly what I think Nick mentioning earlier around, you know, designing for recycling, designing, designing for recyclability, that's extremely important because, um, you know, it's so big of a, so much, so much of the problem is this low value plastic waste, which is harming our oceans. And that is need to be, I mean, you know, the design needs to, it, it needs to be prioritized, right? Which is why we solve those two problems in a both short term way and a long term way. Um, when we, we know that design for recyclability is going to take maybe five, 10 years, right? You know, for everybody to jump on board a different solution and maybe even longer than that. So what happens and we know, know that we have about uh, 10 years before climate change becomes forever irreversible. So we are financing into, these, into uh, subsidizing the costs of recovering these MLP, this multi-layer packaging, this you know, uh, low value plastic waste is important in the short run uh, to build in crucial needed infrastructure but then funding these exactly the innovations that Nick has mentioned, right? Design for recyclability, different kinds of materials that are super at the lab stage of the moment, or it maybe um, in the accelerators that you know that uh, that Daniela has, you know, we were fortunate to be a part of. We see a lot of our other cohort members from past years, um, you know, having similar solutions. But it's all at the early stage, so providing that financing to help them really scale up and actually enable them to uh, actually close the loop in the first place. Oh, sorry. I think the biggest difference between uh, with it putting carbon and plastic is really in the fact that it's solving the problem of the polluter versus necessarily a, a more disconnected uh, kind of ecosystem uh, around the CO two number. If that makes sense. Okay. No. Uh, great. And let me let me then ask Pavan to sort of comment on more at the macro level because I'm surprised, Pavan, that uh, you have something like Repurpose, who was started by you know really working with rag pickers on recycling to the World Bank that, that talks in billions of dollars. And I think it would be interesting for everyone listening in to get inside some of those conversations. How do you raise the profile of oceans and ocean finance in a world that probably, you know, does it take a backseat to climate? Is it about hitching a ride with climate? Or is, it a, is, there, a, is there a lobby inside those conversations that really understands oceans for itself as an important issue? How do you get into this conversation? How do you build the momentum around? Thanks for that question. You know, when I sit with uh, ministers of environment, ministers of finance, or even heads of state, which I've had an opportunity to do on the whole movement towards transitioning to a sustainable ocean economy, I say one simple phrase, no ocean, no life. And there's economic value to ensuring the preservation of life. And that is human life and wildlife and everything in between. And in fact, you know, in all of our operations, we calculate the economic, uh, an, an, we do economic analysis, financial analysis, and you know, their measurement is incredibly important, but no one number represents all of what we're talking about. So what I wanted to say is what the World Bank and where the World Bank adds value, while you guys figure out all the nitty gritty aspects of the value chain, is we can actually help and drive with our resources shifts in public policy, first and foremost. Create enabling policy that can ensure that the kinds of solutions that we've heard other speakers talk about, to, from ending plastic waste to going beyond that, and for one of our new partners at the World Bank, Parley for the Oceans, that talks about a material revolution, it's not one or the other, it's both and. So enabling policy. And on the flip side, we make sure that our investments, our public investments, reduce the impediments for civil society and the private sector to be a driving force for change. And so if you think that this is at the 35,000 foot level, you're absolutely right. But me and my colleagues at the World Bank, this is how we're thinking. And this kind of bold action, uh, bold thinking, bold action, and a way of structuring big investments I believe is one of our hopes for the future. In fact, it keeps, me get, it keeps me getting up every morning to fight this good fight that is common to all of those speaking today and I imagine all of the participants who've joined you today. No, and I can feel it, which is very hard to feel in a, in a Zoom call. So congratulations for bringing that excitement into a digital format. Uh, I think that's, and it's great. And, and actually, you, you talked about that 35,000 foot view. So let's talk about bold action right on the ground. And, and Daniela, I know you work both on the leadership side of these things, both yourself, but then uh, helping create other leaders and supporting them, and also on the investment side. I think what would be interesting is on both of those fronts, 
take us into some cutting edge stuff. Like on the investment side, what's a really cool new thing that you're seeing? What's a new cutting edge set of potential investment area or even a specific investment that you're very excited about as much as you can share? Uh, just to help us understand what's really new and exciting that's happening. And even on the leadership front, what, what are people doing that's new and different to try and create that kind of bold momentum that Pavan was just talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely uh, appreciate the, the perspective of, you know, bringing the whole value chain together because as we, as we talk to a lot of our, of our startups, a lot of our companies, what, what we mainly find is that they're, they're very misunderstood, right? Because there's a lot of government entities and, and ambassadors and presidents that don't really understand the ocean economy right now. Um, so one of the areas that we're trying to figure out is like, how can we better educate all the different parties that, are, that need to be activated in this space, right? Um, and when you talk about innovation in the, um, in, the, in the space, I mean, what's innovative right now is the fact that people are starting to understand that the blue economy isn't simply philanthropy. And it's more than just, you know, giving a, writing a check and writing it off, but it, it's truly, it can be an impact investment. And so we're seeing a lot of different firms adopt this mentality of understanding and, and being more well-educated around the ocean economy and, and also forming partnerships because I think that's what we need. Um, I think Nick mentioned it's, it's not going to just be, you know, one organization that solves it all, but, but we truly need to have these partnerships of, of helping a company from the seed, right, to the series A, to series B, to the next, um, to the scale up. And that's what we're not really seeing in this area. We're seeing a lot of companies start off and, and it's really exciting to see them um, have their ideas and have their pitches heard. Heard, but then what happens after that, right? If they, if we don't have these innovation partners, these finance partners, um, they're truly not going to get to scale as soon as we can, as soon as they need to get to scale. So that's what we're seeing in the innovation side is it's truly like really just starting with uh, ocean finance literacy, which it's not very innovative, but it's, it's the core of what needs to happen right now um, for uh, other institutions that are more risk averse to be able to jump Jump, jump in and have a conversation with us. Um, and then on the on the leadership side, um, what's really exciting is that a lot of our of our young people on the ground, they're they're starting to realize that they they have the power, they have they have a voice in this space, um, and then enabling them not no longer to feel marginalized or no longer to feel as if um, they don't belong in this area. I think that's that's a that's very revolutionary because oftentimes when you're at these high level convenings such as the UN, you hear a lot of these um, uh, you know, uh, folks that have been in this space for, you know, 50 plus years talk about their white papers and talk about the problems, but um, you rarely hear the, you, you rarely hear a young person come up and, and talk about the problems that they're seeing in their own backyard. Um, so having them work with the people on the ground, educate even people that um, may, may be a little bit concerned about how these new technologies are affecting them, you know, working on the ground with, with fishermen, right? Like that's a huge a component of this that we also don't consider because one thing is to create an innovation and the whole other thing is to actually implement that with people on the ground um, mm -hmm. and creating those relationships is also like very critical because we don't want to come in with technology and, and just um, shove it down people's throats but rather have them be a partner in the implementation and that route will require people on the ground but also corporations to be willing to become pilot project pilot pilot partners with these companies because oftentimes you you have a company they might have enough funding to continue on, but if they don't have a good partner on the ground, um, they're really not gonna be able to prove their model. So um, I think I just went all over the ground in answering your question, but um, it, it really does take just taking those baby steps in education, in collaboration, uh, and in also uh, pilot projects. Right, no, that's, a, I mean, that's an important perspective. And when you talked about what's happening on the ground, but also small business, so let's talk about big business. Uh, Nick, I, you know, you're an alliance of very large uh, businesses. Uh, some of them themselves are large polluters in the space. I'm, I'm keen to understand where, what do you see as the end game? Because, you know, there are alliances that are formed by businesses on multiple social issues. Uh, they, they can be on climate change. They can be other forms of pollution. It's always interesting to see where, you, is there a North Star for you guys? Is there something that says, are you trying to bring every single Fortune 500 company into the fold? Is this about more proving what works and then just making sure that that gets elevated. What, what is the end game of the Alliance? So, uh, I mean, 
I wouldn't say there's there's an end game as such. It, the the fact is that this problem is solvable, right? I, I live in a city where the problem is is uh, is heavily solved. I wouldn't say it's completely solved, but we have we have waste management infrastructure in place. We have very little waste uh, into the environment. Uh, we have uh, we have energy recovery. We have very well functioning recycling systems. So this this problem is solvable. The problem is effectively we we are challenged to be able to implement such a great system uh, in parts of the world where where uh, where they struggle to 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 make ends meet, right? And so our goal is to is to get on the ground in those locations and and village by village, community by community, city by city. We want to work with them to bring these solutions forward and, and indicate what can, what can work uh, and, and partner with organizations and, and financing actually and provide that seed financing to make these things work. So it, it's by, by no means a simple problem. This is a very complex challenge. Um, and the key challenge is that, is that waste management infrastructure is, is, is largely absent in those, those regions where plastic is leaking into the environment. And, and in, for example, in, in Jambrana, in, in, in Bali, in Indonesia, where we have the Project Stop initiative, um, they've been analyzing all of the waste that they're collecting, and 14% of it is plastic. Um, the remainder is not plastic. So the, the challenge is, is really managing the waste management infrastructure and ensuring that there is no leakage of plastic into the environment. Again, not an easy task, but it's only through the, the resources and, and through catalyzing the will of organizations because we exist in an ecosystem, right? As Pawan said, we have to work in that ecosystem together to be able to solve it. So the big steering that comes from, from the World Bank uh, and, and the on the ground efforts from, from a community, uh, those are the things that have to come together to, to be able to solve this challenge. Um, and our organizations are absolutely committed to that. And we're committed to getting more and more members into the cause because we're executing solutions on the ground and, and all these companies, they like to see action and delivery on the ground. And that's what we're doing. Great. And I, and I realize for especially all our, our participants as well, that I've run this thing over. My apologies. But it was a super interesting conversation. So I'm going to, uh, instead of actually summarizing, I'm going to leave you guys with one quick question. Uh, if you can be quick, because I think the audience would find this uh, interesting is, you guys have talked about ecosystems, you've talked about companies, you've talked about billions of dollars of finance from government, you know, equity funds and so forth. That's all great. But you're all, you've all taken time to do this today. You're all working on something that is uh, interesting, but it's quite specialized. So I'd like you to share with the audience, why do you do this? And I don't want to know about your company or your organization. Okay. I just want to know why are you doing this? And it's fine because it might just pay the paycheck. It's, it doesn't matter. I think just, Good to know. What is it that uh, brought you to, to Oceans? Um, maybe, Pavan, you can sort of set the pace here. Well, it's hard to take off my uniform, when, uh, but I, I appreciate the permission to do so. Frankly, we are the ocean, and the ocean is us. And I feel that in every part of my being, and frankly, this is what I've done since the moment I discovered what I want to do and how I want to do and pursue my life's purpose. So, and that way I can help support not only those who are dependent on the ocean, but ensure that those natural assets in the ocean are protected, preserved, and continue to drive value for people like my family who come from absolutely nothing. That's the uh, reason. Probably, yeah, it's a, that's, you have a soulful co uh, connection to the ocean. That's, it's not a competition, folks, but that's a hard one to top. Um, <laughs> Turn it over to Peter. Uh, that's great. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, I think for a lot of us in the uh, millennial generation, if you can call it as such, I think is we, are, we feel helpless um, and we feel that uh, it's, it's already over, that it's, you know, this beyond saving. I think that's something that um, is probably above everything else. All the other challenges on technical level we spoke about is probably the hardest challenge to overcome. Um, and that's exactly what I found so interesting in the work that I do is because it is not helpless and it's not hopeless. Um, uh, but we kind of have to act now. And that's exactly uh, our whole thesis. But more than that, my vision within this and my own involvement uh, and my own like journey uh, from like uh, I started this out of college and everything. I think it's all part of the fact that, um, you know, we're trying to make it easy for everybody. And, uh, and if not, uh, and if we don't make it so accessible, I make it understandable and actually um, uh, engaging, uh, it's going to be possible. Uh, and it, it, that's what 
we gotta fight the whole notion against this hopelessness, and that's exactly what I mean this for. So, yeah. Well, uh, Peter, I won't ever say this on the record, but I'm glad you didn't take up your Dalman offer. And, uh, <laughs> Me too, you. but not off record too. <laughs> right, thank you. Nick? Yeah, for me, it's the, what brought me to this is, is that the problem is actually solvable, right? So I'm very convinced that we can solve this. And um, again, I'm not going to defend uh, plastics, right? So the, the fact is plastics are materials that are important in our everyday lives. Um, and I'm not a plastics engineer, I'm not a, a chemist, but I, I simply believe that they're important materials. Waste management is, is a critical infrastructure that's not there in a lot of places. Um, the way that people consume is also a challenge. And I think what we, what we need to do is work differently, right? And if we do that as a, as, a, as a society, and if we take these best practices that exist in one place and apply them elsewhere, this problem is solvable. So that's why I'm here, because we can solve this. Great. That, that really feels like what the best of business, because that's really what business can do, is, is bring that very practical but uh, forward-moving lens. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and finally, Daniela, to close us out. So I guess, I guess my reason, you, you can actually see it on my, on my screen right here, my Zoom screen, it's the penguins. Um, when I was a kid, I, I just wanted to save them because I, I didn't want to live in the world where my favorite animal didn't exist. And, and that passion then turned into a sense of responsibility that I felt to do something because I had the platform. I, I was privileged enough to, to happen to be at a UN meeting learning about all the threats facing our ocean. And then I also feel like it's just so illogical that we as humans cannot, cannot live in the world without harming our own planet. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And so I think that it is up to all of us to, to truly take, take up this fight and, um, and feel like it's our own ownership because it is our planet and we are all stewards of it. And so that's what wakes me up every morning feeling encouraged um, because I know that I'm not the only person working on this and there are you know, thousands if not millions of, of people globally that, that have the same calling and that um, are in this fight for the long haul. So thank you again for having us. Thanks everybody. Um, I think today you just demonstrated what great stewards of the ocean you are. So I think it was a great panel on, on World Ocean Day. There's a lot of questions. I think we tried to answer uh, most of them. If you do get a chance, you can also just try and answer them online right now. But uh, on behalf of everyone who organized this and I, I think all the participants, thank you again for taking the time. Really appreciate it and I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.